All right, uh, you know, from Oshogbo, let's bring it back here to the studio and speak to Ams Free Ajanoku. He is uh, a media lead at the Center for Democracy and Development, and uh, that's their election analysis center. Armstrong, thank you for being here. And also, our right news analyst, Mahmoud Jaga. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. And of course, Armstrong, I want to start with you. The reason is, I know that uh, the CDD, you were uh, in the last uh, off season election in Ekiti State, um, and now you're there. I know you have a situation room. Uh, right there. So talk to us about wh how your observations so far from your reports trickling in from all of uh, those you've sent down there. How would you say INEC, how would you rate INEC's performance, especially in comparison to other elections, in particular at Kiti, where there were some complaints raised? Yes, so um, in Ekiti there were, there were complaints, but um, I mean, uh, Ekiti was a milestone um, logistics from the uh, point of view of INEC was really uh, impressive and what we have seen in Oshun um, is almost um, also very heartwarming in terms of how quickly INEC was able to get critical election materials to the field and um, the, the uh, other aspects of the process that had to do with what INEC needs to do to give um, credibility to the process I think it has been very impressive in fact um, our data shows that um, INEC has even performed better than it did in Ekiti and we, we want these uh, positive sides of the electoral process to be sustained. Uh, we, we feel uh, we should give INEC a pat on the back because in time past when it didn't get it right, we we're very quick to uh, knock, you know, give them knocks for, for, not, you know, for not getting it right. Now that you know, we are seeing vast improvement in the process, use of technology, the beavers is functioning better, uh, the, the, the time within which um, voters get accredit accredited is, you know, is, is improving. Yes, there are hitches here and there, but those are isolated cases that cannot really vitiate you know, the, uh, the, the positive outcome we are seeing in the process. So uh, we give INEC um, a pat on the back, and in our preliminary statement we issued today uh, around 12.30, we said that much that uh, uh, from the point of view of logistics, uh, INEC has really mm. delivered. There is an improvement. Well, yeah. I want to come to you, Mahmoud Jaga. Well, do you agree with him that INEC mm. has actually, you know, upped its game, um, even though we've seen some complaints, even from our correspondent there, he said beavers, they had some issues in some areas, but generally, okay. It's impossible not to have a few <coughs> issues with technological gadgets uh, like that, but uh, uh, really, if uh, in most places it was performing quite well, I think... Uh, INEC has been learning lessons after every election and also you know these off-season elections are usually easier maybe in some respects to organize than a general election when so many states are voting at the same time. This is one state that is voting uh, that is why the police is able to deploy 21,000 uh, policemen so many AIGs and commissioners. If it is a general election where will you get uh, so many yeah, I just but does this give you confidence, you know, looking at how they've performed in this? By the way, this is the last off-season election mm. as we look forward to 2023. Mm. Does this give you some sort of confidence that INEC is really prepared for the general elections next year? Well, it does. But again, as we said, the general election is a whole different ball game from these uh, off-season elections. When you have one state at a time that you can uh, take care of 30 local governments in Ocean State. Now, when you have several hundred and seventy something local governments uh, voting at the same time. Obviously the logistics are much more complicated and then other things happen like all the court cases, the courts intervene, stop mm. this one, issue injunction here and that uh, causes a lot of uh, the disruption and delay. Mm, but still uh, we are hopeful that uh, when we have good off-season elections like that, at least that's a good trial run for the general election next year. Right. So, well, mm. I want to come back to you, Armstrong, mm. right now. Well, let's still look at some of the challenges, one of which is vote buying. Even going by the report uh, from your center earlier, they said 14 out of 30, they could see agents trying to cajole the voters. How much of a menace is this? And does it look like we're even doing enough to stop it yeah, it's, as a uh, it's, nation? It has really been pervasive in the electoral process. Uh, the question of vote buying, um, you know, that culture of impunity that has now characterized um, that uh, act of vote buying, 
but what we have seen in the last two of cycle elections is uh, some form of deterrence, uh, which is what we have always talked about, that if you want to change behavior, it's not just about moral suasion, it's not just about you know, talking to people to do the right things, you should also have the element of sanctions. And increasingly we are seeing uh, anti-corruption agencies playing a role trying to get into the space, apprehend, you know, those people who are involved in vote buying, apprehend, you know, you know, some of those guys moving around with cash across polling units. And in Oshun um, today, what we also saw was a lot of the vote buying was discreet. And it was discreet because people knew they could be caught, people knew they could be arrested. And even one of the lessons from, um, from um, Ekiti was the fact that even communities are now beginning to shame those who engage in selling their votes or, you know, possibly those who uh, engage in vote buying. Uh, you know, there, there was a case of uh, a lady who was involved in vote buying. Her picture was displayed all over the community. And you, we are beginning to see a community response also to the incidence of vote buying. So uh, I think it's fundamental for us that um, that deterrence factor is there. And we saw it today. There are also reports today of, uh, you know, some um, uh, people who were involved in uh, vote selling, vote buying, uh, being arrest arrested. So the next step we want to see is uh, pursuing those cases to a logical conclusion, ensuring that, you know, those people who have been arrested are, you know, used as an example to you know, the rest of the voting public. Well, we're still talking futuristic now, hoping that they get prosecuted. Mahmoud Jaga, let me come mm -hmm. to you right now. Looking at uh, another civil society group talking about the situation, room, they say mm -hmm. they have raised some doubts over the credibility of the elections because of the alleged public sales and buying of votes. And even the candidate of the Labour Party, Yusuf Lasso, actually said, if vote buying persists, Nigeria is in bigger trouble than we want to admit. So let's talk about the implication of vote buying to our democracy. It is a <coughs> notoriously difficult problem to tackle, you know, it's deeply embedded in the society and with the poverty situation and the poor political culture. You know, as you said, uh, even at the last uh, party conventions, we saw EFCC and uh, ICPC agents, you know, descend as a convention venue. But uh, those of us who are experienced in election reporting said, no, but... Uh, convention delegates are not bribed at the venue of the convention. You know, it must have taken place back in the hotels or even in their states. Even with this uh, voting, it's the same thing. It is only the crudest operators who come to the polling unit with money in the bag and say, before you go in... And even those cuts some. with the bags of money. I remember, you know, even in the last general elections, there were some. But how many of them got... Justice. Did we get justice? The yeah. prosecution process. Yeah. And they are few because some most have called of for, an, uh, for a commission to mm. particularly prosecute electoral offences. Do you it, think that will help? It was one of the recommendations of the Waste Panel back in 2008 that there should be an electoral offences commission. The problem is that not long after that, uh, the federal government had the Orosanye Committee report, which said the country had too many. Uh, uh, agencies and parasita was even to give away to reduce them so it was not time to create a new one you know ordinarily it is the function of the police so people say INEC has not prosecuted I INEC is not a prosecutorial uh, agency and it cannot uh, gather all the people who shared money and prosecute them I, ideally the police should do that with the state attorneys general but uh, the police is also handicapped uh, everybody is handicapped, but a solution has to be found because it distorts uh, so many things about our democratic uh, culture. But as I saw one politician say, he said, uh, with the economic uh, problems that we have now, it is very difficult to stop people from collecting money. And most of it takes place not at the polling unit, but back in people's houses. You know, politicians in any community compound, they will have one organizer who will go around the day before the election, share rice and sugar and some money and uh, things like that. And they have a way of monitoring, even though it's a secret uh, a, a, a ballot. So most of it takes place really beyond the reach of the security agencies or even the election officials. But we have to keep working 
on the problem because it is a terrible problem. Keep working on the problem, but yes. let's proffer solutions, mm. gentlemen, as mm. we wrap this up. Because at the end of the day, you cannot remove the mm. economic realities. Looking at the data coming mm. from the uh, Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, mm. inflationary rates, food prices are mm. high. People are hungry. More people are falling into poverty, worse than we had prior to the 2019 general elections. How worried are you about vote buying going into the 2023 elections? And what is the way forward in terms of solution? Yes, we are, we're really very worried as um, a civic group. We are uh, exploring all ways in which uh, you can deepen that conversation further. And one of the strategies we are looking at is to say that, yes, you have this negative dimension of people buying votes, but you also have exemplary conduct. Right from the Anambra governorship election, you had a women's group which said, we are not interested in you know, you giving us money to get our votes, fix an infrastructure for us, fix a particular road. They, those women took their advocacy to Governor Soludo, insisted that a road had to be fixed, you know, for them to vote for him. And so they were able to connect their needs. So if you talk about the poverty, it is somebody that you still have to elect that will implement a policy to address poverty. So we need to increasingly co connect the electoral process to the bread and butter issues and not reduce it to you know, things like cash, stomach infrastructure, you know, make those issues around poverty you want to address a fundamental part of the campaigning, a fundamental part of the discussion that the candidates will have, such that at the end of the day, you can have policies come out. So let it be that it is the policies that are driving, you know, what the, you know, political actors will do and not just to come and give people 2,000 and 4,000 and then in the next four years, you know, they are nowhere, they are nowhere to be found. Right. Well, gentlemen, I would have to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Mahmoud Jaga, Rice News Analyst, thank you so much. And as well as uh, uh, Amsfri Ajanoku, who is the media lead at the Center for Democracy and Development. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for having me.